Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alameda County Master Gardener's presentation of Facts and Myths of Tree Care presented today by Pan Bone. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Pam Bone, who will myth bust some common misconceptions and help you succeed with your trees. She is a landscape horticulturist and Sacramento County Master Gardener who holds a plant science degree from UC Davis and developed the first Master Gardener program in Northern California, class of 1980. She teaches classes and gives presentations for Northern California Master Gardeners, garden community groups, and landscape professionals. Her hands-on experience comes from maintaining an intensively planted one-third acre water-efficient landscape that includes many landscape trees, shrubs, ground covers, California natives, and several kinds of fruit trees. Today, she spends her time diagnosing home horticulture and answering gardening questions at the Sacramento County Cooperative Extension Help Desk, staffs plant clinics at home shows and the state fair, and records horticultural segments for the podcasts Garden Basics with Farmer Fred and the Green Acres Gardening with Farmer Fred. Welcome, Pam. Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction, Maggie. Yes, tonight we're going to talk about the myths and facts of landscape tree care. And even though the title here says tree care, a lot of what I talk about tonight will also pertain to other woody ornamentals and in fact, even fruit trees in some instances. And um, so I may use trees quite frequently, but every so often I'll substitute ornamentals or uh, woody ornamentals or shrubs for some of the presentation that I'm talking about. What we're going to learn tonight is what the research over the years has taught us about the right and wrong ways to plant and care for trees. We're going to learn about planting and what's the right tree size, what's the right planting hole size, how to use amendments in the planting hole, are they necessary or not, is it good to have grass or lawn around trees, and what about staking, how to do it correctly, what's the bad ways to do staking, uh, fertilizing and mulch. We've got a lot of information on fertilizers and whether or not we need them in landscape trees and then uh, using mulch as well. Watering, that's a really big thing in the landscape, particularly with a year like this where we've had very little water. And pruning, another very important topic to learn about and understand so that we have healthier, safer trees. So let's get started with some of the myths. Uh, plant a large tree as it will readily establish and go faster in the landscape. People think that all the time. They don't want those puny little trees at the nursery. They want a really big tree like these large ones in this 24 inch box. But in fact, research has shown us that larger trees have many problems. We call it the root to shoot ratio being kind of out of balance. It means that the top is not in balance with the roots with those larger trees. You've got too much top and too little roots. And so what happens is that water is lost out of those roots faster than that poor old leaf canopy can take up. And then that water stress that we have reduces the production of the tree food, the carbohydrates, the sugars and starches that actually keep a tree growing well. And then you get a lack of growth, obviously, then and then more important than anything, we've seen a real serious problem with the reduced root quality in the larger trees. There's a greater chance of them being pot bound or having circling or kinked roots. So it's a real problem. And we see it more often in the larger trees because they've had to go through several pottings up from the smaller size when they were started in the wholesale nursery. In fact, this poor planting here, every one of those trees eventually died in a very short time because the roots were just not able to take up enough water during a hot summer. The myth, small trees grow too slowly. The fact is, smaller trees actually grow more quickly and outperform the larger trees. We've shown that studies that the bigger trees grow more slowly and are smaller after several years of growth than the smaller trees planted at the same time. Within five years, oftentimes, you will see the outperformance of that younger tree that you said, oh, that one gallon, that's just too small. I don't want that. And then um, you may have a living, vibrant tree after five years with those larger trees, they may be long dead. 
Smaller trees overcome the planting stress more readily because they've got that good root to shoot ratio. The roots in the top are in proportion and more importantly, is less chance of being root bound in the smaller container because they haven't been potted up, potted up. So five gallon trees are a great choice. In fact, if you really had your choice, do what mother nature does, plant an acorn or a tiny little seed. Those um, they know, mother nature knows that you have to have a lot of root before you have even just a couple of little leaves showing. Circling, girdling and kinked roots are such a serious problem of landscape trees and shrubs actually, that um, it bears witness that the smaller the tree and the less likely that you have that, the more important it's gonna be for good growth. Root problems usually begin in the nursery. You'll see here this poor circling going round and round or these kinked J roots, they call them, that are really serious problem because the roots can't get out into the surrounding soil. And then they just go bound up inside uh, that root ball. Then when you plant them out into the nursery, they just get worse because it's like a tourniquet around the trunk and just strangling it off. Or here's a poor little ginkgo with a root just bound up inside there. And here you are growing a tree for a few years and pretty soon you've got a problem. Like this one here. This uh, was a 15 gallon tree and this is actually the original root ball of it just basically cupping the um, soil and the roots going under instead of spreading out. So you've got two scenarios here. One is that the tree is dying back because the roots can't go out into the landscape to explore the water and nutrients, or the tree may grow for several years and it can't get out to anchor the tree down. So you don't, you need that anchorage of those roots in order to help um, so that during wind uh, events, you don't have the tree blowing over. So here's what exactly what happened. This happens to be in a parking lot of one of the big um, department stores. And here we have girdling roots. First of all, they planted a root barrier around it, a box, so to speak, to prevent the roots from going out into the uh, concrete here and out into the sidewalk and the parking lot. But unfortunately, they left it staked too long, which we'll learn about. And then it led to the failure of this um, uh, purple robe uh, locust. And unfortunately, there it is. All that effort, all that energy that they spent growing this tree. And then one day I came upon this purple leaf plum. And actually, I didn't get a close up of the roots, but the roots were the same thing. They were just going round and round inside this planter box. They couldn't get out and they were bound up and they just blew over in a windstorm. Root barriers, I mentioned it just briefly in that last slide, root barrier boxes, people think they're gonna plant them and they're gonna prevent the damage of roots to their sidewalks, to their driveways or whatever, any kind of a hard structure, a hardscape. And unfortunately, these roots uh, just get bound up in these boxes, whether it's going round and round. Now, sometimes a root here will try to escape like this little skinny guy here or these over here coming through and trying to get out. But most of the time they just bind themselves up in there. And so we've done a lot of research with the university and others that show that root barrier boxes are not the way to go. So they are not going to be successful at all. So if you have poor growth in a tree or a shrub, you need to suspect, do you have circling kinked pot bound roots? And I'll give a good example here. This is a Japanese maple and it was planted with the bald and burlap uh, system that we don't see as much, uh, but these specialty trees sometimes come out of Oregon and that, and they have bald and burlapped around them. And after seven and a half years, it wasn't growing at all. In fact, it looked like I had a miniature bonsai and it had a very poor root system when we blasted it off. And I knew this is what was probably going to be the issue. The tree never grew, but it never really looked bad. But then pretty soon, there was just too much top, even though it wasn't significant, um, that it couldn't take up enough water in the hot summer and started looking scorched. And sure enough, look at these roots. These are, again, what we call J roots and very limited root system at all. Uh, the tree, even if it had survived, if it had gotten very large, it could have even blown over. Though a Japanese maple is not as uh, prone to that because they're a smaller tree. So always check the roots if possible and correct any problems that you have before planting. This Nisa sylvatica or Tupelo tree looks wonderful. It was, comes from a five gallon um, container, but even so you wanna go through and you wanna look to see, is there matting? You know, you do this with your tomatoes and your petunias and other things like that, where you see those matted white roots at the bottom and you kind of separate them out before you plant them. The same thing goes for trees and shrubs. Make sure you loosen those roots and 
actually, there are some arborists that feel this is such a serious problem that they recommend blasting off the soil and looking underneath to see what's going on because a lot of roots are hidden and you can't see that. And if you see woody roots, not just these fibrous little roots like this, but woody ones like you saw in the slide I just showed, you probably should reject that and take it back to the nursery because it's almost impossible to correct those at all. Now, if you've got just these kinds of roots here, you can do a little light trimming um, on the roots and then a lot more roots will grow from that. And that is a good thing for that. <clears throat> also, another thing that about roots, there's a myth that tree roots grow just as deep and look just the same as that leafy canopy. Uh, the shape is exactly the same, but you know what? That is a complete myth. The fact is tree roots are shallow. They spread for wide distances. They don't grow deep into the soil. It's typical to have like this crepe myrtle that was dug up and we're looking at this root system and it's just a few inches from the surface. That is typical. Deep is not very deep. Um, nowadays. And a tree is like a wine glass on a dinner plate. If you think of it that way, where you've got your dinner plate here, consider that your root system. This is the tree with the leafy canopy up here, the little goblet portion. And then you've got your trunk. And then you've got a little bit of area of roots here where they're just coming out and, and those sinker or anchor roots that are just uh, holding the uh, root ball in place. And then you've got all these other lateral roots going out for great distances. In fact, here is a rather complicated slide here, but this is being recorded. So you'll be able to get a copy of this later and go through these more carefully. But 90% of all roots are in the top 18 inches of soil, 99% in the top three feet of soil. Whether or not you have great agricultural soil or urban soils, this is what is usually what's going on. Sometimes you'll get a deeper soil, you'll get a little bit deeper root system, you'll get some roots we call sinker roots that'll go down into the soil. But with urban trees, especially, this is very common. But what's really important, look at this root spread. We used to say the drip line, that's where water comes off this imaginary end of the leafy canopy. And we used to say, oh, as long as you don't do anything to this area inside, you're safe. Well, we're finding out, no, the majority of the roots go beyond that drip line and out for great distances. In fact, one and a half to two times the height of the tree. And it may go four to seven times that drip line area. And this has very serious consequences for, hey, maybe your neighbor just put down some sort of a weed killer and your tree roots are way over in their yard. Um, maybe you're putting in a new sidewalk or a new driveway and you're cutting roots and you think you're far enough away. And there are a lot of implications for understanding where roots grow. The lateral support roots are very shallow. They're only eight to 12 inches. So when you say a tree is deep rooted, it might be the 12 inch one and a shallow rooted, it might be something that's only an inch or two under, or it might be one of those surface rooters like mulberries or ash trees or um, alders and things like that. And those are woody. There are these fine absorbing roots that keep growing out, out, out into the soil to explore and look for water and nutrients. And those are not woody and they are often called feeder roots, but they are truly absorbing the water and the nutrients. Tap roots are rare. How many people think, well, I've got a tap root. That's gonna go way down into the soil. Well, when an oak first starts and it germinates, yes, you'll get a tap root going down, but here we've got a tree, it just squeezes it off. And usually it will not go down into the soil. And the reason that roots don't go down into the soil, lack of oxygen, hard, dense soil, won't go down. Trees need to breathe. Their roots need to breathe just like we do and they cannot tolerate soils that have no oxygen. And it's not, there's not much oxygen down deep. So there's a myth then that trees need a big deep planting hole. You know, the $5 um, tree and you dig a $10 hole. Well, it's probably, you know, the $50 tree and the $100 hole, but it's not that anymore because it used to be that you'd throw everything in but the kitchen sink. But we don't recommend that at all anymore. We show that these deep holes after, often act like a tree grave so that the tree then just sinks and does poorly because it doesn't have oxygen. The roots are all buried. We don't want that. 
So the fact is you plant too deep and it could be like this native oak here that has a fungus called Phytophthora. It's a water mold fungus. It was covered up in a park situation where the lawn grew right up to it and covered all of this flaring roots here. And unfortunately, with frequent watering, which oak trees cannot take, but a lot of other trees can't as well, it started to suffocate and no oxygen. And then these fungal disorders love it wet and they don't mind not having oxygen and they come in and rot it away. Then the tree either just dies or it can be a failure and it can blow over. Trees decline or grow poorly when you cover up their roots and trunk because the oxygen is reduced. Here's a good example. In this case, we have a camphor tree that um, was planted at lawn level and only years later did they put in this brick planter and then they planted some uh, ground cover and some uh, little bits of flowers and stuff underneath it. And slowly but surely, see this dying wood here? That is a lack of oxygen in the soil. And the roots then are starting to literally go, <coughs> I can't breathe. And then you might get some fungus that'll come in too. And it may be slow. It may take years for this to slowly decline. And basically you're starving the tree for lack of oxygen. This cherry tree had an original root system right here, but see this dark line? It was covered up clear to here. And even though the tree tried to put out another root system, it wasn't enough to sustain it. Even though you look and went, oh, it grew pretty well for a while, but after a while it failed. The best planting practice, make tree holes shallow and wide. Go out as far as you possibly can. We say a minimum of two times the diameter of the root ball, whether it's in a container or bald and burlapped um, or even bare root. However, if you've got a clay soil or compacted soil, three to five times the diameter is ideal. You're actually creating a planting area. And then the depth, you do not want to go deep into the soil. It's best that when you plant that the uh, plant, the tree, the shrub is planted at least one to two inches higher. So in fact, you don't want to dig it very deep. And if you accidentally dig it too deep, you're going to have to fill it in and you're going to have to pat it down and make sure that it's nice and firm. So this is a, ball, a bare root peach tree that I put in. And this goes for peaches and, and nectarines and cherries and all your fruit trees, citrus, all of them. These practices of planting, uh, making sure that you've got a good spread, shallow, but deeper or uh, not deep, excuse me, wider area. Don't cover this root crown area, the flare area, the trunk flare. You don't want to cover it with soil or you don't want to put thick mulch on it. It doesn't hurt at all to see these. And that is important because this is the real problem. The telephone pole look. When you've got a telephone pole look, then you've buried this and you already saw with that previous oak tree in that park, what happens with burying the trunk area and that uh, root flare area. So if even with a bald and burlap or any kind, you it's fine, high and dry, the flare is exposed. Here it's too deep and it only has to be maybe one or two inches um, above that original flare for it to just sit there and languish and never really grow and then maybe eventually die. Tip, clay soils. To minimize settling, if you're at all concerned, just use a mound or Another way to do it is you can dig a deeper hole here, but see this, it wasn't even dug at all. It can be a square, it can be a circle or whatever you want, but it's on a firm layer of soil that wasn't disturbed. And then it's okay because the roots um, are going to be up higher and the tree is not going to settle and yet you've got a nice area for planting here. Planting too high, however, may also cause problems. Now, we have trees in nature and you go, oh, wow, look at this guy here. He, he's thriving, kind of small, but uh, it looks to me like he's going to get up and walk off any minute, but he's adapted. However, in this case, um, we don't know that this might be subjected to wind throw, particularly if the tree like this one is very large and see all these very um, shallow or surface root 
and then you get a big wind and they go over. Um, also, remember those absorbing roots that we call the feeder roots? Well, they can dry out and then they don't function as absorbing roots, absorbing the water and nutrients, especially at planting time. Here's one right here that um, might have been a problem when it was first planted because you've got a lot of little fibrous probably absorbing roots and they probably have all died because they're all exposed. Okay, another myth. Remember when you get ready to plant trees and shrubs, you're supposed to put all that stuff into the planting hole, everything but the kitchen sink. But we found out that those soil amendments, the compost, the organic matter that you get out of a bag or that you uh, make yourself um, should not be added to the planting hole. Um, it's not good. I think compost is great. I have seven compost piles. It can be used in many different areas, but not in the planting holes of trees and shrubs. In fact, the university has done a lot of research. They've actually looked at a lot of research from elsewhere, and they have um, said right in their UC leaflet, which, by the way, is free online planting landscape trees. Don't add fertilizers, soil amendments, or any kind of root stimulants to the planting hole. They found that there is seldom any difference in the growth of the trees or shrubs, whether they're amended with the um, compost material or not. And in fact, I have some research studies that shows that the tree can just sit there. It feels like, oh, I don't have to go out anywhere. I've got everything right here. So the roots are slow to go out into the native soil where they need to go because you need to get them out there for support. You need to get them out there looking for water and for uh, nutrients. And then what if you dig that hole and maybe you dug it when it was a little bit moist and then it's compacted because it's clay. It's like watering and putting water in the bathtub. And then you get that effect of root rot and lack of oxygen. And then um, organic matter. Organic matter breaks down. In fact, if you've ever had compost yourself, you know, as those little creatures, the macroorganisms or the little microorganisms, the little fungi or the earthworms or the sow bugs and whatever are working away, they use that as their fuel, their food, and they break it down. And pretty soon it all settles and there's not much left. And so the whole plant sinks then. You don't want to do that. So use the original soil that came out of that dug hole. Amendments, on the other hand, can be beneficial if you're doing an entire planting area. So if you're putting in a vegetable garden or an annual or raised beds, um, perennial beds, you're putting in a lawn, yes, then you can go in and you can work the whole area that that's where the roots are. You know, a tree, it, you already saw that the roots can go out four to seven times the height of a tree or out beyond the drip line four to seven times, one and a half to two times the height of the tree. And so a root system that's going to be 50 feet, 100 feet from the trunk is not going to benefit from a little bit of stuff piled in a little tiny hole there. So, but if you're putting in a whole area where the roots are, a strawberry bed, for instance, or whatever, or a container plant like this, or a raised bed, then it may be uh, beneficial and is, and that's where I use all that compost from those seven compost piles. Another myth is, People think, oh, I need to put vitamin B1 in. It's going to overcome transplant shocks and the plants will grow better. Well, guess what? Research that's gone on since the 1930s has shown it doesn't work at all. It doesn't increase the plant growth. It doesn't overcome transplant shock. What does that mean? It means that the plant should do better, right? It should have more roots. It should have more flowers or whatever. It doesn't. And so we don't recommend it at all. It's of absolutely no value, except for a nursery fellow once told me, well, Pam, it gets them to water their plant because you have to mix it with water and then pour it on. Well, that's not a good enough reason to waste your money on this. So if you need it and you really feel that there um, is a necessity for it, then use fertilizer. That's going to do the job, not the vitamin B1. There's a myth then about that mature trees and shrubs, they need to have regular feedings of fertilizer for good growth. Nope, that is a complete uh, myth buster. The fact is fertilizer is not needed almost ever for woody ornamentals with a few exceptions. So landscape trees, woody ornamentals, the soil, this is a nice happy tree. It is its nitrogen, its phosphorus, its potassiums out there and, and it's picking it up. And if you have a good root system, those roots are gonna get out into the surrounding soil and they're gonna pick it up. But when you plant trees and shrubs, sometimes when they're young 
or just recently planted, then they may benefit from nitrogen fertilizer, which promotes growth. And it can be any form of nitrogen. It can be from manures or fish emulsion, various organics. It can be inorganics, whatever you want to use. Just read and follow all label instructions for whatever you're going to use. There's a myth that when you fertilize, you are feeding the plant. You know what? You are not. Fertilizer is not plant food. I stuck in this little fancy photosynthesis thing just to remind you, maybe back in your high school days, you kind of remember, oh yeah, um, what plants do is they photosynthesize and they take the chlorophyll in their leaves and mix it with some carbon dioxide and water and out comes some sugar or carbohydrates and some oxygen. And that is what is happening to a tree. And it's doing its own food. Most of the time, you find that poor plant growth is caused by other factors. It's caused by soil or water or roots or environmental stresses, insects or diseases. So fertilizer, lots of different choices on the market out there. Um, and they say food on them, citrus and avocado food, food uh, fruit and vine food. We're never going to get away from it. But remember, just remember deep down inside, it's not food. You have to have a healthy plant with healthy green leaves in order for it to feed itself. And in fact, here we've got a Japanese maple that is sunburned and sun bleached. It's not iron deficient. Here we've got a juniper that died from root rot. You're thinking, oh, I should put some fertilizer on it. Or this Dawn Redwood, some people look at it and think, oh, it needs more green. No, it just was underwatered. In fact, I want you to stop doing the chicken soup approach. You know, chicken soup is supposed to be good for everything that ails the human, right? If you've got a cold or the flu, you know, have some chicken soup. And we use that chicken soup cure-all cure approach for anything that's anything that we think is wrong with the plant, we apply fertilizer. We don't want to do that. You need to do some detective work. You need to go and find out, well, maybe I've got the plant in the wrong location. Is it needing more shade, more sun? How's your watering? Is the soil too wet or too dry? Is your irrigation system adequate? Is it putting on a sufficient quantity of water? Too much, too little, that's a problem. Are there any signs or symptoms that you can see of an insect or a disease that might be affecting the plant? How about the bad root system? You already saw those really bad girdled, uh, kinked root systems where food in the form of nutrients that are already in the soil um, are not being able to be taken up or water. So that could be the problem. And you have to have healthy roots to absorb that water and those nutrients. So you want to fertilize landscape trees and other woody ornamentals only as needed, as warranted. So we do find, as I was saying, that young trees and woody ornamentals will respond to nitrogen sometimes several weeks or months after planting. And some people do that to promote some growth. We don't see deficiencies in phosphorus or potassium in, in pretty much most of California. It is very rare. So a complete fertilizer for woody plants is rarely needed. And then older established plants don't need fertilizer at all. They don't even need that nitrogen. You don't want to promote a lot of growth that then either has to get pruned off or that maybe aphids attack. You know, aphids love new growth. So instead, we apply mulch or compost instead of fertilizer. So healthy trees and shrubs, look at the, here they are. Now I wouldn't recommend planting a redwood this close to an old school building, or here's the city of Davis and they're in the sidewalk area. You see, wow, they're surrounded by um, concrete and asphalt, but yet they've never applied fertilizer. And then this is one of my neighbors. And I asked him, boy, you, uh, your Laura Petalum is just beautiful. And what do you do for your azaleas? He goes, nothing. They just grow. He doesn't use fertilizer at all. And so sometimes the soil just provides what you need for all your woody ornamentals. However, I do want to give a caveat though. Some plants do grow better when fertilizers. It's almost essential that if you want a lawn that's somewhat green, you've got to have some fertilizer applied. You can get carried away with too much fertilizer and certainly don't go out and put on fertilizer right now after this talk on your lawn because summertime is the worst time. You do not want to promote growth on any plant when it is so hot outside and you are going to have problems then with uh, stimulating growth that then can the roots accommodate getting, getting all that water to that new growth? So flowering perennials, berries, fruit trees, vegetables, they all benefit from fertilizer because anything that produces fruit 
uh, usually needs at least one application of some sort of fertilizer a year. With vegetables, with their very shallow root system, they're going to need a complete fertilizer. With fruit trees, plain old nitrogen usually once a year is all that's necessary. Unless you're using lots of mulch like I have here in my berries um, and other compost over the top, you may not need a fertilizer, but every couple years on your fruit trees or your berries. So instead of fertilizer, you've heard me say the word mulch, putting on wood chips, putting on bark, putting on your own compost on top, you feed the soil. Healthy soil equals healthy plants because it equals healthy roots. And so it's going to increase the biological activity. Remember all those microorganisms and everything chewing up all that material down there and it releases the nutrients and all the good things that are in that organic matter that you're putting on. That increases the porosity, means just more air in the soil. And then the fertility because you're release, releasing nutrients. It's gonna reduce compaction and erosion so that you can walk on soils judiciously when they're wet with lots of mulch down, which you wouldn't want to do at all without mulch because then you would ruin the soil structure. Um, insulates the soil. By insulating the soil, the soil is cooler. And you know what that does to roots? It cools the roots. And what's that do? Make them grow better. It conserves water. That right in itself is essential. You cannot have a water efficient landscape without using mulch, definitely to conserve that water. And you need about a three to six inch layer for not only conserving the water, but controlling your annual weeds. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're not gonna get rid of your Bermuda grass or your nut sedge, those perennial uh, bad guys, uh, so to speak. Uh, with just putting mulch down because they can pop on through. And then importantly, protecting trees from mower damage and from string trimmer damage, you want to keep away from the trunk. And I think I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And then improving the landscape appearance. So here I've got a pile of mulch that was delivered. It's still steaming hot. And then um, some roses that I put lots of mulch on. And here's, I've got lots of wood chip mulch everywhere, but then top dress with my compost and it adds even more nutrients to it. That's my husband doing all the work while I take the picture. Um, there's a myth then that trees planted in the lawn steal the water and nutrients from the grass. No, they don't. Do you know that lawns are the greedy ones and they're the ones stealing nutrients and water from the grass? And this is a little bit complicated slide here, but I just want to show you, it's not just the water and nutrient competition of the grass. There's actually a chemical reaction. There is, um, There are chemicals that come out of the roots of the turf grass, out of your lawn grass, and we call that allelopathy. And these chemicals are inhibitors. They Stop the tree, they won't grow. Um, I've got a picture here. This was over at UC Davis. And these ginkgos were doing beautifully in the shrub bed with no lawn around them. This tree used to have lawn right up to the trunk. It's undersized, fewer branches, small leaves, often um, sunburned trunk because it just can't grow um, like the nice, healthy ginkgos, all due to lawn. And a research study that um, Dr. Richard Harris, a professor at Davis did with some of his colleagues on several occasions, showed this puny little magnolia right here with the lawn growing right up to the trunk. And then look at this nice, healthy one. Now you don't need this big an area like I've got here, 196 square feet, but they're basically showing you the difference here. It's dramatic what um, can happen to trees when lawn is planted up to them. And a lot of times we say trees are very slow growing. Well, magnolias are one we say that with, and maybe they aren't so slow growing. It's because of the way we treat them. So a tip here is to keep at least a 12 to 15 inch circle or square. So 24 to 30 inch diameter away from the trunk of newly planted trees for at least two to three years so that the tree then can get strong and healthy and get its roots out. And then it's not so much of a problem unless you want to avoid the disorder, lawnmoweritis and weed whacker woe, we call it. And basically what it is, is, you know, people on their riding lawnmowers or others have to get as close as they can to the trunk or they take their string trimmer. I've seen people go down one side of um, a whole median strip of trees on both sides and completely cut off this cambium, which is where all of the food and um, water tissue is 
regenerated in a tree and they just cut it off and killed the tree. Now they put this in after they'd already done all this damage to the tree. On the other hand, I looked at this tree from a distance and went, oh no, did they do string trimmer here? And I got up close, no, somebody taken a hatchet to every single tree at a school and they had to replace every one of them. So kind of a tragedy on that. But this is one that could be avoided for sure without um, any real difficulty by just keeping the lawn away and keeping your uh, string trimmers away. Better yet, if you really wanna be safer, keep the trees out of your lawns. This is my uh, backyard and all my trees are planted, whether they're shrubs, I mean, fruit trees or large landscape trees, there's nothing in the lawn itself. And in fact, um, this happens to be an apricot right here. Um, it'll help you water better too, because lawns don't need the same kind of watering and vice versa. Trees don't need the same kind of watering as um, lawns do. So keep it out of the lawn area if you can. It'll be a lot safer for it. Now there's a myth. Let's talk about staking. Securely stake the trees because you want to develop a stable, strong root system and strong trunk. And a lot of people say, oh, but my trees blow over if I take the stake off. Well, that's because they didn't stake correctly in the first place. Improper staking is detrimental to a tree. Look at all this. This thing isn't going to go anywhere, but this is a rubbing injury waiting to happen all the way down the trunk. And then in this case, which is supporting who? Um, the tree is literally grafting itself into, well, the stake, it's grafting itself into the tree, I guess. And then here we've got something where you've got injury right here. It's all rubbing away. And then the tree here is rubbing down here as well. So this tree, this is eventually going to just rub it right off. And that's going to be a very dead tree not too long from now. And the fact is, there's a lot of research that was done by um, Dr. Richard Harris again and his various colleagues in that they showed that rigid staking produces weak trees. They don't, the roots don't grow as well. We have to move, you know, people have to move. In order to be healthy and vigorous, we move, move, move. We're always hearing constantly about exercise, exercise. It does everything for you. It does a body good. Well, I guess that was the milk commercial, but the same thing with exercise. Trees are the same way. They have to exercise. You know what movement is? Wind blowing on them. And this whole thing is called thigmomorphogenesis. Well, you don't have to remember that, but I put it in there in case you wanted to know. So when you move, 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 plant hormones are released and it, it makes the trunk get fatter and it makes the limbs grow better and it makes the roots grow more. So we don't want to just lash it to a stake. Here's one during the research that wasn't staked at all from the time that it you know, was first grown. And here's one that was very tightly staked right next to it. This is shading the trunk. It creates weak wood over here. And it also reduces the ability for the tree to move back and forth. So it's a real problem. We do not want that. Instead, use the two stake method when staking, where if you have to stake and like this tree, this is going to be a weak tree. You take all these tree ties off, which you need to because you've got to get rid of that nursery stake and that tree may just flop over and some of them even lie on the ground. They're so weak. So you take that nursery stake off and you put a stake on either side of the tree with a tree tie going here and a tree tie going here at the lowest point at which the tree will stand up. Right. So then the tree can sway back and forth in the wind and hopefully the, the stakes are not too high either because otherwise the tree sways back and forth and beats itself to death on the stake itself. So the lowest point where the tree, when you pull it back, it'll come right back to the upright. If you pull it back and it's still leaning, raise those tree ties a little, make it a little bit taller stake. So, and use broad ties so that you don't get uh, cutting into the wood of the tree where you're going to get injury to the tissue inside. Staking gone bad. Well, some people try, and unfortunately they've got this two stake method here, but they've left the nursery stake on which defeats the purpose of the two stakes being able to move back and forth because the tree can't move. This one was the same exact way. And then the stakes are all lopsided and falling over. And you know what happens then? You start getting rubbing injury right on here. It's just a weak tree and a tree that you might have injury to. And the same thing here. And unfortunately, with staking, whether you're staking improperly or even if you're staking properly, it is so sad to see 
the various stakes and the tree ties embedded in the trunks of the tree. And once this happens, the tree, if it goes all the way around like this pine tree here, it will be dead. It may take some time, takes a long time to starve a tree from all the food and, the, and then the water. And then this one, this was a, a fruit tree and maybe you'll be lucky and it won't go all the way around and you just lost the limb, which they've already lost. Um, and this one right here, look at this. This is a one of those tree tire type ones and then skinny little trunk down there because all the food's coming down and all of a sudden, oops, it can't go any further because you've basically cut into all of that wonderful, um, what we call vascular tissue that uh, supplies the the food the, um, and uh, water transport ability. So these are very bad and you see them everywhere. I've been taking lots of slides lately and I never run out. Um, this one was very sad. Um, the owner asked me to look at the tree because it was starting to fail and it was much, much thinner. This one doesn't quite do it justice how bad it looked. And I looked up close the tree had been in for 25 years. So this was the original staking. And there's the little green tree tie embedded. And it goes all the way around. And here's another one. And that means that tree will die. It can't, you can't do anything about it when it's like that. It will die, unfortunately. Here's some recent staking examples. I kind of went out and took a bunch of pictures. And some of them definitely need improvement. Others really tried. Um, this one here, sometimes they need to, tie it in two spots because it is so weak that it will not um, stand on its own that way. Sometimes they leave the stakes a little too high and this movement then kind of can beat on that. So you have to be a little careful, say, especially with something like this. And then if you look carefully in here, there's that nursery stake, even though this looks like a great job with the two stake method. I just wish they'd gotten rid of that nursery stake, which is really preventing it from moving. And then how long do you support the tree with those stakes? And well, when the tree, in this case, there's the graft. It's literally grafting itself into the tree, but really what it's doing is just creating a huge wound area there that can either cause the limb to get fungus that comes in or the limb to snap off. And here's another one. Which one is the tree trunk? They're both the exact same size. And this is where people will say to me, but the tree won't stand by itself. But how long can you leave your arm in a sling if you've got a broken arm or something and then it's healed up? Do you just leave it forever? You know, it's kind of a weak, puny little arm. And if you don't start exercising it, the same thing here. So you do it as short as possible if you have to stake. And if it won't stand alone for two seasons, you better find out. Maybe you've got to restake it, lower it so it can move more. Thin out the top. Maybe you've just got way too much top to that puny little trunk. And then encourage those little trunk laterals. We call these little temporary nurse branches. They actually are photosynthesizing and they're shading the trunk. They're providing food to the trunk and they help strengthen it. You got to keep them short though. Don't let them grow crazy. Um, otherwise they'll take over the top of the tree. And then maybe you've got circling pot bound roots and then you might have difficulty in ever getting it to grow at all or standing straight up. Okay, another myth is that most tree problems are caused by insects and diseases. Well, they're not. Improper watering is a leading cause of decline and death of landscape and fruit trees too, particularly fruit trees, I see. Every one of these native oaks died because they received too much water especially in the summer months when they're not supposed to receive water at all. This one I just took about a month ago and it's slowly but surely dying. There's two trees right next to each other. And whenever you see this little massive just growth like that, this we call it witch's broom, it basically shows the trees on its last limbs. It's just trying to throw out every little bud of life that it can, but it will soon be dead. And the same with this. This was a live oak. This was a valley oak and I'm not sure. I think this was a valley oak too. It's hard to tell. So you can't just water. This poor fellow here thought that it was just like with the oaks that came from back east. And he says, well, I had to water and I, because I thought that's what they needed. I, I come from the east coast where they get water all summer long. And then he put raised beds around it and covered up. Remember, no telephone poles. And what do we have here? Telephone poles. And the fact is overwatering can lead to reduced root growth. Um, it'll suffocate, the tree will not grow well. You'll have root suffocation, which may lead to root and crown um, diseases or just the fact that it doesn't have oxygen can cause it to die back anyhow. The roots will die, decline and death. And when you've got algae or moss 
and algae or water standing in the middle of summer, you are putting on way too much water, perhaps too frequently, too much at a time. And that is going to be a serious problem over time. And besides that, it wastes water and we're in a drought. And we need to be very conscientious of how much water we use. And by saving water and irrigating effectively and efficiently, we'll not only save water, we'll save our trees and shrubs from dying. Here's one of those fungus I keep telling you about um, various things. I keep mentioning the Phytophthora, the water mold fungi. Well, there's another one called Armillaria, or oak root fungus. And these nice little fruiting bodies here indicate this is going on underneath. This is a golden rain tree, a colrutaria, and these nice fungal plaques, when you cut in with a pocket knife and you smell it, oh, they smell so mushroomy and wonderful, but they're killing the entire plant. And you know, oak trees in mother nature can live just fine with armillary out there because they don't get the summer water. As soon as you start pouring on the water or poor drainage, there you get it. Too much water is the reason that all of this um, is happening to this pineapple guava. It's a whole hedge and in the middle of July, again, moss. Now, maybe if you lived in England where they get summer water most of the time, but certainly not in Folsom, California. The fact of the matter is though, underwatering can also lead to reduced growth, decline or death because it, um, You'll get poor leaf growth, poor root quality, and then you can get the trunks that are sun scalded, which leads to bores. This is so sad. All this expense, all this effort to grow these trees, and then they're just letting them die. This happens to be one of our local malls in the Sacramento area. A little tip. Get to know your soil. You have to learn to bend over. You need to go find out. Check your soil. If you can get a soil tube, that would be wonderful. If not, get a screwdriver or a little hand trowel. Go down and find out how deep did this uh, water, you know, just water like you normally do. Then go back a day later. How far did the water uh, go down? How far did it spread from the plant? Is it really um, looking wet or uh, maybe mucky even? Or is there standing water? Or do you go, oh, it's kind of dry in those areas and, and pick up the soil and, and feel it and, and see, does it look really dry or does it look really wet? You need to bend over. And then sometimes the nurseries will give you soil probes. Well, not give you, you have to buy them, but um, they're available at nurseries. We used to have a nursery here that carried these soil probes or soil tubes, and now they don't anymore, and I can't find them locally. So you can go online. I've had my soil probe since the very first Master Gardener class when we graduated back in 1980. We all bought... Um, soil tubes. I was in charge of the program at that time. And um, I said, hey, you guys all need to get a soil tube. And so we bought them and I've had mine ever since. Um, they're called soil samplers, soil tubes or soil probes. And one brand online was called a tube sampler soil probe. I guess it was covering all its bases. They, uh, the myth is deep roots mean that trees don't depend on lawn watering. That is not true at all. Um, unfortunately, trees decline or die if lawn irrigation is reduced or stopped. So remember, tree roots are shallow, especially so in lawns. You don't want to do this to it, especially with this drought. Think about that. If you're going to let your lawn go brown, you might be killing your trees. And how long does it take to grow a 25-year-old tree? Yes, 25 years. Myth, trees grow too tall. They need to be topped and headed back for safety. That is the biggest myth of all. Unfortunately, look at this topping right here. In the 1980s, I took pictures with my old Kodak uh, slides. Here, I took it with my digital. We're still seeing it. Here it is, a eucalyptus. Here's another one that was taken in 2014. Same liquid, liquid amber, liquid amber, doing the same thing. Never top trees ever. Not landscape trees, ever. Top trees are hazardous. They're prone to decay. They can get bores. They'll have limb breakage and breakover right here. This can rot. This can rot. It'll come back in here. Here it is rotting. Sunburn is really significant. Could you even tell that was an olive tree if I didn't tell you that? So don't top trees. The Tree City USA Bulletin of, uh, available from the Arbor Day Foundation tells you right there, don't do it. Topping destroys a tree's function and beauty. It's a blight on the community, a blight on your neighborhood. It's a blight to the tree. A top tree is never a safe tree ever. Someday it's going to fail. 
if you top a tree like this, you either need to remove it or you're going to have to keep it like a little short shrub or hedge for the rest of its life, unless you want to take a chance of having a very hazardous tree. This is an ash. I don't even know what this thing is. I couldn't tell. And then a myth. Mulberries, though, you need to prune them back every year. Nope, that's not true either. The fact is, Topping mulberries does the same thing. It eventually leads to dieback, decay, and limb failure. You get all these limbs, they get really heavy over time. And if you don't prune them out or keep them stumped back way back, like my neighbor, he loses about a limb every single year. Pretty soon there's not going to be anything left. Thank goodness. So this is not safe to do this every year. And it's not polarding. This is polarding. Polarding is where you take your little pinky finger. That's how much growth you're taking off every single year or no more than every two years and you use hand shears to do it with and then you've got this little knob and really it's more of an art but there's science behind it too that shows that this is actually um can be healthy for the tree but not what you're doing where you're just whacking the mulberry back any willy-nilly way you want on the other hand maybe the naturally pruned ones are more attractive it's up to you the thinning cut is the fact of the matter is what you need to use. It's the proper pruning cut for all landscape trees. Actually, it can be used on most fruit trees too, except for when the tree gets up to size, you can do some very tiny little heading back cuts. They're not topping because you're not doing big limbs, but it is a heading cut. In this case though, you're removing the branch completely back to its point of origin. You're gonna um, contain the original branches, the original structure, the original limbs at the ends, the twigs, and it's going to have its original beauty. You won't get unwanted shoots. It's going to be a safer, healthier, more attractive tree. And proper thinning retains a tree's original growth. This is my oak tree. Can you imagine going in and just sawing it off with a chainsaw? No, you want to see all that nice little twiggy growth out there. That shows you that you've pruned it correctly. When you can see that you've pruned it, it usually is bad pruning. In fact, many arborists have told me that they leave all the brush on the ground because the biggest compliment really is, did you do anything for all that money I just paid? But on the other hand, that's what a tree should look like when you get done. It should just be safer. It should be thinned out a little bit. So on the other hand though, excessive thinning, where you start at the bottom and you whack everything up all the way up, we call that lion's tailing or a little poodle dog tail. Then you've got cuts all the way up and unfortunately they can sunburn and you've got sunburn damage here and these limbs are very top heavy and they can break out, borers come in, decay comes in, you don't want that. A myth is, oh, you're going to flush cut really close and you're going to paint with wound paint. Nope. More research has also shown that trees don't heal their wounds, they actually close them over but the wound is still there underneath all that closed over wood. This is an obsolete practice. It's harmful. If you hire a certified arborist or an arborist that's educated, they will never recommend using wound paints at all. Don't use them. They're ineffective. They can cause sunburn. They can be a real problem. And then flush cuts remove the branch collar. This is the tree's natural barrier to decay. They see this little wrinkled area? Well, when you cut into that, you're removing the tree's natural band-aid. You're creating a large trunk wound, not just a branch wound. And these little bark beetles and these fungi come on in and rot the wood away. And that can be serious structural hazard later in life. So look for the wrinkles. Look for these little wrinkled tissue and just cut beyond. It's a little swollen area at the base of every branch, whether it's a fruit tree or a landscape tree, either one. And you can do it successively like the city of Sacramento did with this hackberry with a chainsaw. So look for it. We call that natural target pruning. You're looking for the tree to show you where to prune. You're not making it flush to the trunk. And proper pruning, it'll callus and close properly. You'll get rid of those decay or help prevent those decay fungi. They may not close entirely if the wound is too large. Sometimes you'll get nice heart callus. And then educated pruning. It results in a tree that's safe, attractive. It'll save you time and resources because you're not whacking it all the time. Look at the difference. Even mulberry, this is on the UC Davis campus. Doesn't that look great? This is a tree that was pruned correctly. So properly cared for trees add beauty. 
They have health benefits. They add additional value to your home, the community and wildlife. And so we want to encourage you to encourage your squirrels, encourage your beautiful fall color, encourage healthy trees by taking care of them properly. And I love photographing trees so that I could just show you the photo credit, most of those uh, slides, except for with ones that I did point out to you um, on the slide itself, are all ones that I've taken myself. And I love to go out and just take pictures of trees of all sorts, whether it's a horse chestnut or a eucalyptus in Hawaii, or a beautiful river birch here, or dogwoods, uh, the liridin, a tulip tree, or my favorite, the ginkgo. Ah, oh, I love them. And then here we go with some information on landscape trees, which I know was posted in the chat, if I, uh, I think at the very beginning. These are some very trusted sources where you can go get good information on landscape trees. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And I guess it'll be time for questions. And we'll have a question and answer monitor handling all of your questions. So question one with a little clarification of compost over mulch. Or yes. mulch over compost. Okay, there's a, a difference. Compost is worked into the soil. Compost is organic matter of any uh, different sorts. Usually compost, if you're making your own, is made up of food scraps, uh, especially things like, you know, broccoli and cauliflower ends, cut ends and things uh, from your kitchen, uh, mixed in with leaves. Uh, some people with grass clippings. I don't happen to have grass clippings because I grass cycle. I don't have a bag. Um, so I don't get that source. But Grass clippings are a great source. So you mix this dry material with this more moist material and you get compost. If you buy compost in a bag at the nursery, it is usually from various mills and they scrape it up off the floor <laughs> and it's the leftover tree things that come off of the floor of the plywood mills or the various uh, lumber mills. And that's what that is often enriched with other things too. That's compost. It's meant to go in and be mixed into the soil. Mulch on the other hand is much larger. It's usually, it can be bark. It can be arborist wood chips that they deliver to you. Any source of organic matter. Now, technically speaking, anything that covers the soil surface can be mulch even landscape flat fabric and oh, oh, gasp, black plastic. But I only recommend organic natural mulch that comes from parts of plants. And uh, that's what it is. And that goes on the surface. Those are the differences. And I use both. I use a lot of um, mulch on the surface and I use my compost when I work it in for my vegetables and my berries and when I'm putting in new strawberries or doing things like that. But I also put that compost over my mulch once a year on all my fruit trees because that is a nice source eventually of fertilizer once the microorganisms and the little uh, earthworms and others break it down. Okay. Once a year on the fruit trees, I think. We yeah. Got that. So Susan has a wisteria that she grew from a seed. She uh -huh. planted it in a one gallon pot, pruned away growth to get a main stem. She's since planted it. She's afraid to remove the stakes because the top growth is considerate. The main stem is about two um, inches in diameter, but is at least seven feet tall. Ah, uh, okay. With a lightly supported by a substantial pergola. Well, see, that's it just it. Um, Wisteria is not self-supporting. It does have to be supported by something until it gets wet and you can have it where some people train it to go around so it'll be more substantially attached that way. You and it's a wisteria is very large and it needs a very, very substantial structure over time. It will not stand a flimsy pergola, unfortunately, <laughs> or it's going to overtake it. So what I would say is that it's got to live sometime or another on its own without that stake. And the stake eventually is going to hold it back. Um, if you're trying to keep it miniaturized, maybe you might be able to, but I have a feeling it's going to take over and you might have problems with the tree ties getting embedded in the wisteria. I try to nurse it off of that and then make a more substantial thing to actually tie it to temporarily to get it up. Great. So I see we have one minute, but I have three questions. Oh yeah, sure. 
Well, how about if I toss them your way and you can decide which ones? Oh, okay, just answer all. I, yeah, I've got a couple minutes, I think, here. Okay. So yeah. is it okay to let a baby redwood grow from the base of an adult one? You can, however, a lot of times what will happen is the competition, the tree is weakly attached. It's not growing in the ground with its roots down. Um, in Mother Nature does it all the time, but um, the weaker tree is often the one more subjected to blowing over and that and not being supported. So I don't usually recommend it. If you want a nice substantial redwood, get rid of the, the little parasite on the side. Okay, so I guess the last two I can actually put together. So okay. our chipped oak leaves as mulch. And the final question was about coffee grounds. Okay, so oak actually oak leaf, leaf mulch, almost any leaf is fine for mulch. Um, we did a lot of research. People get really worried about oaks. They get worried about pines. They get worried about um, eucalyptus, camphor tree, thinking, oh, they're going to leach out all these weird chemicals and everything. Nope. It works out just fine. It actually inhibits growth of weeds, which you want. So for all woody plants, shrubs and trees, most anything goes. If you're at all concerned, uh, then you just don't use it in your vegetable garden. I use it in the pathways of my berries or my vegetable garden, but I might not put it right in there. So for woody plants, nope, anything that you want. Coffee grounds, oh, best thing ever. You put compo uh, coffee grounds in your compost pile and pretty soon those red wigglers that people use for worm composting will just show up on their own in your compost pile. It's just another really good source of that moist material that they need. So yeah, put the coffee grounds in there. Great. Okay. Pam, thank you so much. But from all of our hearts to you from 1980. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. I just love doing this. It's great. It's, it's nice to impart some information to people and hopefully you'll go out and, and as one of our really famous researchers, Dr. Alex Scheigel used to say, he says, now take this information and go out and touch trees. And by touching trees, you're going to touch your community. So that's what I want you all to participate, all you participants to do then. Well, you have touched us and that's just not a saying. Thank you so very much from all of us. And I okay, see all thank of you. And thank you all for attending. In the chat. Thank you.